So glad to have you all here together in the building. Again, this is such a blessing. Uh, we were kind of trying to figure out, uh, today is kind of a, somewhat of an experiment, I suppose, with the two services, but the first service was pretty full, so it looks like we'll probably keep this going for two or three more weeks at least and just kind of see how, how this thing goes. But uh, really glad that you guys could come in and, and join us in corporate worship today and the teaching and of God's Word and fellowship and all that good stuff. So I am just praising the Lord, man. This has been so sweet, so sweet for me to have, have everyone together again. And so just really praying and trusting that God's going to speak to us through His Word today. And uh, how about we, we have a word of prayer to that end? Father, we bless your name. We praise you. God, you've been so, so good to us. And we love you. Lord, we desire to give you all that we could give you. Lord, we want to give you our lives, our hearts, our mind, our hands. And so I pray, Father, that, uh, that you would receive our praise. And even as we transition into uh, a time of studying your word, I pray that that would be worship and that it would bring you great glory and that you would be honored even in that. So please, Father, open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things from your word. Open our hearts. Open our minds. We need you, God. Um, I pray that your words would not fall to the ground, but that they would land on good soil, that our hearts uh, would receive it gladly. And though these are some challenging things we're going to be talking about today, Father, I pray that we would be moved by your Spirit to repentance and to humility and to love and to service. So we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 is where we are going to pick up. And this is a very familiar story to many of us. It's the, the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a very well-known story even to, even to uh, people outside of the church, outside of Christianity. They understand it to be a great story about humanitarian care and, and effort and certainly something that could be drawn out of that text, but it's so much more, so much more. And so before we get into the text, I just want to share with you why I am where I'm at today, uh, why, why I, I bring us to this, this text. You know, it's, a, it's an understatement to say that things are crazy out there, is it not? And I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately. You don't even really need to hear me say it again, but the reality is it is crazy, and it is getting crazier all the time, all the time. And you wonder what's going to be next. Well, I mean, what, what's going to happen next week? Because it's just one thing after another after another. And what's going on in our culture today, in our society, in our country, around the world is extremely complex. It's a very extremely complex situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple guy, simple kind of guy. And uh, I'm not a scholar of the culture or social affairs. I'm, I'm generally kind of detached from that. And... Um, you know, my job today is to try to help us have a, a biblical mindset in the midst of all of this. That's, that's what's on my heart. How are Christians to live and to act in the midst of a world that seems to be just falling apart? You know, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about the temperature out there, what I'm seeing in the church, um, the church abroad, the church in Napa, this church in, uh, also as the pastor here. I see fear. Uh, anger, divisiveness, even paranoia at times. And I'm concerned. I'm concerned about me. I'm concerned about us. I'm concerned about the name of Christ and the testimony of His church. Everybody is mad. Everybody is fighting, separating, drawing lines. But we as Christians, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to draw lines and pick fights. Now, we stand for righteousness, and we want to be lights that shine in a dark world. And we are to hold each other accountable as Christians to a higher standard of, of holiness, to be sure. And so we do believe very specific things, and we stand for very specific things. We make distinctions, we celebrate diversity, but we're not to pick sides and pick fights. We're just not to do that. You know, our command before this crisis started and continues to be to love God with everything that we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This does not change. Nothing changes that, be it political, social, economic, 
racial, religious distinctions even. We are to love God and love others. We are to love and trust and obey and serve God. We are to model Christ's likeness. Love, pray for, serve, reach, show kindness and understanding to and bless our neighbors. That's where it's at, folks. That is what we are to be marked by. And so that's the exhortation that we see that comes out of the text today as we look at Luke chapter 10. And so if you're with me there, we'll pick up in verse 25. First, we're going to see a test. Jesus is going to get put to the test. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So we have a lawyer here. Sometimes these guys are referred to as scribes. Maybe you've heard that when Jesus is dealing with the scribes. These guys were considered the experts of the law. They copied the law over and over, handwritten copies. And so they were considered experts. They knew the law um, very well. And so when we talk about a lawyer here, we're not talking about lawyers in the sense that we understand it necessarily. Uh, but they were experts of the law of Moses. And so whenever there were issues... When there were disputes, you could go to the lawyers, the scribes, and they could usually clear that up for you because they were an expert of God's law. Well, this particular scribe, he came to Jesus with a test. His objective was to test the Lord, and we're told there that's the case. So this is his true motive. This is the motive of his heart. It's not that he just wants to know or, or grow or change or anything like that. He wants to trip Jesus up. He wants to put Jesus in a situation where Jesus may give the wrong answer, no, not, not know what to say, and then to discredit or disqualify Jesus, essentially. But he asks this question. He says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What should I do to inherit eternal life? That's a great question. He asked the right question, and he asked it to the right person, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. People come with silly questions sometimes. They really do. You know, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? You know, just kind of bizarre things, right? But this guy had a very serious and the most important question, frankly. And so Jesus is going to respond by uh, taking it ultimately to the greatest of the commandments. So verse 26, Jesus said to him, Well, what's written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself so Jesus says what's written in the law what is your reading of it what does the, what does the word of God have to say I love how Jesus Jesus points to the sufficiency of the scripture the answers are in the Bible and Jesus says what does the word of God say about it you're an expert of the law you tell me essentially and so the, law, the lawyer responds by quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. He couples these together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Leviticus 19, to love your neighbor as yourself. So we're to love the Lord our God with everything that we have. Everything that we have. All of our faculties and capacity, we are to give it to God. We're to love Him with our mind. We are to, to know God, to study God, to engage in truth. We're not to just, you know, shut our minds off, as it were. It is uh, an intellectual pursuit to know the truth about God. But we're also to love Him with our heart. It's not purely academic. We're supposed to love God. The truth of who God is ought to draw us into a loving relationship with Him. I've heard it said that worship is theology set on fire. It's when you are moved by the truth, you can't help but worship and love and serve God. That's what ought to happen. But then it ought to work its way out practically. It's not enough to just worship God with your mind, know Him, or, or to worship Him with your heart, but then to serve Him and to bless Him and to bless others. It's to become an others-focused kind of a lifestyle as you have been captivated by the truth of God and a love for Him. Amen? And so that's what it amounts to. And we're to love our neighbors as ourself. You know, we love ourselves, don't we? Let's just, be, let's just be real honest with ourselves. The problem is never that we don't love ourselves enough. People talk about self-esteem and the culture and all of that, but the reality is we esteem ourselves great. And from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, I mean, we are thinking carefully about, about how to bless ourselves, how to care for our own needs. But we're called to love people like that. 
to love God with everything that we have, sincerely, affectionately, intellectually, practically, and we're to love and care for other people practically the same way that we care for ourselves. And so, verse 28, Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, Well, who's my neighbor? And who is my neighbor then? So Jesus said, Look, you've answered rightly. Good answer. Uh, and in Matthew 7, 12 and twenty two forty, Jesus says that all of the law hangs on this command. That if you are loving God like that, with everything that you have, and you are loving others as you love yourself, you're going to naturally fulfill the law of Moses, the law of God. You're going to walk in that because that's the nature, that's the essence, that's the heart of God's commands, God's law. So if you are seeking after Him with everything that you have and loving others sacrificially, intentionally, then you are going to be keeping the law. So Jesus said, you've answered well. Do this and live. Do this and live. There's a couple things here that, that, that come into my mind when I hear this statement. First off, I think that statement, do this and live, is supposed to bring him to a place where he says, I can't do this. I mean, has anybody ever done this? Can you do this? Can you love God with everything you've got and love others like you love yourself? And so the reality is, we could never do this. There's only been one who has ever done this, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has fulfilled that perfectly. And so he ought to come to God and, and fall on his face in repentance and, and crying out for help and in humility, saying, God, I need mercy because I can't do this. That's, I, I think that's really the, what Jesus would, would have this guy come to that realization. But there's another side to this. The idea of doing these things and living. God's word is amazing. God's word is life-giving. God's word is life-changing. And if you will do these things, you will live. I don't preach a prosperity gospel. I, I stay as far away from that kind, of, that kind of theology as I can. But look, here's the thing. If you live according to God's precepts, it will go well with you. It will go well with you, generally speaking. I know for years I did not live according to God's commands, God's precepts. And I know how it went for me. I know what life was like back then. But when I put my trust in Jesus and I began to want to walk in obedience to Him, I saw what God did in my life. It went well for me. Life is so much better when you are in right relationship with God and you are walking in His ways. And so there's a lot of truth to that statement. Do this and you will live. You want to experience life to the fullest in this life, love God with everything that you have and love others as yourself. There's true life in that. That is the way to live. Well, the lawyer appears to know he's in trouble. He can't keep that. He hasn't kept that, and he knows it. So he has to justify himself, we're told. Seeking to justify himself, what does he say? What's the question? Well, who's my neighbor then? Qualify that for me. Because I'm sure that he had loved others as long as they were within his group. People that, to him, were lovable. I'm sure he was a good neighbor to the people whom he deemed worthy of his love and service and care. So he's going to try to get himself out of this situation and clarify for me. Who are these neighbors? Well, Jesus, in order to answer that question, gives us this iconic story that we know so well, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so that's what we're going to see now, picking up in verse 30. This is the example that Jesus gives when asked, Who is my neighbor? Jesus explains it this way, verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So, uh, this man is coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem, it's always downward. Whenever you hear it in the, in the scriptures, it's referred to that way because it's very high up. It is 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is 1,000 feet below sea level. So this route is extremely treacherous, 
and it is steep, and it is windy, and there's a lot of rocky terrain where people could hide, and it was known to be a, a trail or a path of murder and robbery, and so when people did traverse through here, it was extremely dangerous. So when they hear this language, it is uh, almost certain that they're seeing this vi very vividly in their mind, what Jesus is saying here. And we're told that this, this guy fell among thieves. They fell upon him, they stripped him, they wounded him, they left him for dead. They took everything that he had, and then they beat him nearly to death. Well, verse 31, Jesus continues in his story. He says, Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So we're told that a priest and a Levite passed by. They came. If he were laying there and, and could see them at all, surely he would have thought, Thank you, Lord, there's help. Someone is here to help me. The very people that you would expect to help. But what do they do? They pass by on the other side. Uh, some have said that it could be that this priest was actually leaving his priestly duties there in Jerusalem and is now heading back home. And so he just came from doing his religious duties, and this happens. And how does he respond? He does not help. He passes by on the other side. Some have said, well, perhaps, perhaps he thought it was an ambush. Perhaps he thought this guy was laying there and this was bait. And that as soon as he came to help, he would be taken by the thieves. Or perhaps he thought that the thieves were still in the area. And that uh, if he came to help, then those thieves would get him too. You know, the reality is this is just a story. It's a story that Jesus is telling. And we can read all kinds of what-ifs and kinds of details into it. But that's not the point. The point is they did not love God and love their neighbor. They didn't do it. They had an opportunity to, but they didn't. The very people that you would have expected to be the ones to love God and love their neighbors did not do it. The very servants of God. And so that should be a challenge to us. That should be a, a, a caution for us. You know, we may even look down on those guys and think, you know, I can't believe that they would do such a thing. But the reality is, folks, listen to me. We're all guilty of this, and, and we know it. We have all passed by on the other side so many times when there were people that were hurting and needing help. And maybe we even acted like we didn't see it or didn't notice. Now, I saw a pastor teaching this text, and he, uh, before the church service, they actually planted people outside the church. Every, every route that you could have taken to get to the church, they had people posted up out there who were in need of help. And then uh, as he got this point in the text, he, he tells them that, and then he puts the picture up on the screen behind him of the people that were out there. And I think of like a thousand plus people in the church, one stopped to try to actually engage one of the people and help them. And uh, I think that's just a, a really shocking and vivid uh, illustration of how so often we can be for whatever reason. But there's no excuse there. And so Jesus, Jesus now is going to show us someone else enters into the story, a Samaritan. The Samaritan came, and he had compassion. Now, a Samaritan would have been a fierce enemy of the Jews. The Jews and the Samaritans did not like each other, and they had a long cultural history. When the Jews were taken out of Israel, when they were taken into captivity by neighboring countries, by their enemies... Some of them were left behind. Some of the Jews were left there in Israel. They took the best of the people, and they left the poor and the, the beggarly, the weak. And then those countries that took the Israel, Israelites out sent some of their own people to live in the land of Israel and to, to become habit, inhabitants of the land, and they intermingled. They, they intermarried. They had children, offspring. And that was where the Samaritans came from. And so they were Gentile and Jew. And you know, the Jews had a history of just pure hatred for the Gentiles. Anyone who was not a Jew, that's a Gentile. And so they saw the Samaritans as traitors, as, um, you know, they would use language like half-breed. And that's a really harsh thing. We hear that and almost wince at it because that just sounds so bad. But that was the way they treated them. And we saw this 
even at the well in John chapter 4. You know the story, the woman at the well? When Jesus passed through, he said, I must pass through there. And the, what did the woman say when Jesus spoke to her? What are you doing talking to me, a, a Samaritan woman? The, the Jews wouldn't even pass through that land. They would go out of their way to cut across up along the border and back into Israel so that they would not have to pass through Samaria. But Jesus didn't. He engaged them. See, he transcended those boundaries of time, space, gender, and race. Nothing would hold Jesus back from the mission that the Father had given him to love and reach all peoples. And so later on, we see that Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, when they wanted to really get at him, when they wanted to really dig in and try to um, insult him, they called him a Samaritan. They said, you know, they called him a demon-possessed Samaritan. And that to them was like, ooh, they really stuck that knife in when they did that. That was the way that it was. And so this is the person, Jesus says, that comes in, and has compassion on this man who fell to the thieves. Not the Levite, not the priest, but the, the Samaritan. The Samaritan came in, and he had compassion. So verse 34, Jesus is going to begin to show the kind of compassion that he had. Verse 34, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. This is extraordinary care, is it not? I mean, consider the lengths that this guy went to to care for this man who was left for dead. First off, he risked his own life. You know, if it was a potential ambush or the thieves, in theory, were still in that area, he risked his own life by going to help this man. He did not consider his own well-being, his own welfare. He risked it to help this man. He disregarded cultural prejudices. He didn't let that stop him from having compassion and showing mercy. He detoured his own plans. He was inconvenienced. He was on his way somewhere. He was going somewhere. He had something to do, but he stopped to help this man, to have mercy on him. We're told that he bandaged his wounds. You know, the guy had been stripped. So in order to provide these bandages, it's altogether likely that he would have had to take his own clothes and rip it to be able to bandage this guy up. And then he poured his own oil on his wounds. We're told he set him on his animal. You know, did he get off his own animal and put this guy on it? And now he had to walk this treacherous territory alongside his beast of burden so that this man could be on his animal. And then we're told that when he took him to the innkeeper, he stayed the night with him, and then he paid the innkeeper two denarii. Now, there was a, a archaeological find that suggested that a night's stay in an inn would have been a 32nd of a denarii. So basically, he paid for two months worth of stay for this guy to stay there after he left. And then he said, whatever else he owes you, whatever else, uh, whatever other charges uh, might come about, look, put it on my, on my tab, essentially. I will repay when I come back. That's extraordinary care, folks. Is it not? This is how we would care for ourselves. This is the kind of care and love and treatment that we would gladly give to ourselves. This is the kind of care and treatment we would hope somebody would give to us if we were in that situation, is it not? This is a picture of how Christ loved us. We were enemies. We were alienated from God. We were separated from Him. We were dead in our trespass and sin. Jesus, in His heavenly glory, existed with the Father from all eternity, and He set that aside. He emptied Himself, Philippians 2 tells us. He came to this earth, he took the form of a human, a human being, a male, a man, and he lived a life of perfect obedience to God's holy law. He lived a life that we could never live. He kept God's commandments perfectly in ways that we never will. And then he paid the highest price. He suffered, he suffered for us. He died for us so that we would live so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be redeemed, so that we would be made whole, so that we would be healed. 
And so when I see this story, I see that's the kind of compassion that Jesus had on us. And so if our Lord and Savior has suffered like that, if he has served like that, if he has blessed and cared for, had compassion on us like that, even when we were enemies, because Romans 9 says, excuse me, Romans 5 says that when we were enemies, God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So this is the kind of care that we see. And so now the challenge. Verse 36, so which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy. He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So Jesus asked, which one was the, was the neighbor here? And so he flipped it around. It's not who is your neighbor, it's to whom are you being a neighbor. That's what it amounts to. Everyone's our neighbor. Everyone that you pass by, everyone that's in your sphere of influence, that is your neighbor. And you are to be a neighbor to that person. Now this should have driven that lawyer to humble repentance. And he recognized that he can't, he can't, he hasn't, he can't. But conversely, this is a very real thing that God expects us to live by. We know that we can't do it perfectly, but it is the standard. And that's what I'm trying to get at. That's why I'm laying all this framework here to kind of bring it back home in some of my closing thoughts. I'm going to talk about the culture that we're in, the temperature of the church even, the climate today, and how Christians are behaving in the midst of it. Because, guys, that is, uh, that is what... I think God has really put on my heart here. We can't change the world. The world can be changed through the gospel. God can save and change the world. And God is working to that end as he is building his church and he is bringing people into his church and he's changing the world one heart at a time. But you and I, we can't fix this world. We can make it a whole lot worse, I feel like, but we need God to get to the hearts of men through the gospel. And he uses us to do that. He uses his, his people. And that's the answer. The answer is not in, in social reform and changing laws and adding laws. It's in God's law being implanted into a person's heart. Amen? And that's our hope. That's the hope for a dying world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we are to be neighbors to the world... And we are to be conduits through which God's truth and love, His mercy, and the gospel flows. That is how we are to be a neighbor in this world. And so, just some questions and some thoughts here as we're kind of bringing this thing to a closing here. How often do you take into account the greatest command? How often do you think about this? How often do you think about the fact that we're supposed to love God with all that we are, our minds, our hearts, all of our strength, and we're supposed to love other people too? We're supposed to love other people like we love ourselves. Though you can't keep it perfectly, is it your aim? Is this a standard by which you seek to live? Is this the grid through which you check your thoughts and your feelings and the intents of your heart? Who do you consider to be your neighbor? Who's your neighbor? To whom are you a neighbor? To whom are you being a neighbor? Do you have an us against them mentality? This is what I see, really. It's rampant. Us and them. Me and them. And I think if we're all honest, we've all got this in our heart. This is the propensity of the human heart. It is division, dividing lines. There's me and mine. There's us. There's them. And it's going on all around us. And there are a million different ways that I could, I could demonstrate this, but I'll just give you a handful, some of the big ones. Democrat, Republican. Democrat, Republican. Pro-life, pro-choice. Fox News, CNN. Citizens, illegal immigrants. Masks, no masks. I mean, that, that is a blazing battle that's happening all the time. And so I could keep going. I mean, the list is endless. But this is, 
what we see, and it's always what side are you on? Well, here's my question. How can you be a neighbor to someone who is your enemy? When you're thinking like that, it's me and them, us and them, how are you going to be a neighbor to that person? Is that, how is that person your neighbor? This is not an option for the Christian. We've got to check our hearts. It starts in the house of God. That's, that's my concern. You know, I could have preached 15 different messages today based on what's going on out there, but this is what I think is right in front of us. We as Christians, as the church, how are we doing in our own hearts? How are we interacting with other people? How are we loving the world and loving our neighbors? Are we adding to the the division and the, the inflammatory conversation happening out there? Is our hearts getting more and more hardened? Well, this is not an option for the Christian. As I said, we may not be able to fix everything, but we can make it worse. We can add to it, to be sure. And honestly, guys, I'm going to bring it in even a little more specifically. Social media. Social media, man. I, I, I'm sorely disappointed, frankly, by so much of what I'm hearing and seeing on social media. I'm not, I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I've tried a couple of times to get into that world. And I tried again here recently when, when this whole pandemic hit and we stopped meeting because I wanted to be able to communicate with you guys and, and kind of get into your world. And I felt disconnected instantly when, when this happened. But honestly, my heart was so grieved by some of the silly and weird things that I would see on social media. This may be very old to you guys, but I still am weirded out by selfies. You know, it, it was weird years ago, and it is still weird. And I can't, some of the stuff I, I see, and I'm like, this is just too bizarre. But you know, the stories that I'm hearing, people are coming to me and saying, so-and-so said this, so-and-so did that. There's this meme over here, or this article over there, or this video, or this person posted a video, and I'm just like, man, what is going on in the church? You know, we're not allowed to mock. We're not allowed to ridicule. We're not allowed to divide. We're not allowed to be propagating conspiracy theories, and there are all kinds of them swirling around out there right now. You know, um... The conspiracy thing. I just want to encourage you guys. Watch out for that. Because it, it's just been, that has really amped up. It's kind of always shining a light on what the enemy is doing. Rarely emphasizing what God is doing or what the actual solution is. Uh, it spreads fear, paranoia, cynicism, rage, rebelliousness, division, pride. And the church is not allowed to get, get sucked up into that. I don't want you all to get sucked into that, folks. You hear me? As the pastor, I'm asking you, please don't get sucked into that. Please don't be spreading that around. You know, if you're really taking sides and drawing dividing lines and championing your cause and it's something other than the gospel and the advancement of God's kingdom, I'm not sure you really believe you're of another kingdom, you know? And these are things that God has been revealing to me about my heart. I'm speaking to you guys out of the overflow of things that the Lord has been doing in me. I have opinions. I have feelings. I listen to certain things, and I get angry. I mean, just angry to the core. And it just dawned on me, I, it cannot be. I can't walk in God's commands. I can't pastor well if, I got, if that is the condition of my heart. And so we as the church, we as Christians, we need God to change our hearts. You know, do we spread the gospel like we spread conspiracy theories? Do we stand for the gospel like we would stand for our rights? You know, I, I just I don't want us to be a, a source of contention or bring reproach on the name of Christ. And we have, and we do. We've got to stop it with the us and them mentality. We need to pray that God would change our hearts, that God would break our hearts, that God would give us his eyes and give him, us his love, his mercy, his compassion. You know, the rage that you're feeling, the rage that I'm feeling, do we feel that kind of rage about our own sin? When's the last time you got so angry about your own wicked heart or your own shortcomings? And I'm putting myself in that boat too, collectively, us. When's the last time we had rage over that? 
And so we need God to, to heal our hearts. We need God to, to change our minds. We need God to knock down those barriers and allow us to see people the way that he sees people and to love our neighbors and to reach our neighbors, to serve and to care for our neighbors. We need God to bring revival to this land. We need God to bring healing to this place. That's what it amounts to. And I'm, in a way, I'm kind of encouraged because, you know, when the, the Jesus movement back in the late 60s, early 70s, the culture was this, in this pure upheaval. I mean, it was, it was bad. And God moved in an amazing way. And sometimes I think, man, is it going to get just so bad and all of a sudden God's spirit is just going to move across our nation? Could it happen? I desire to see that. I know you desire to see that. It starts in our hearts. It starts in the hearts of his people. Let's pray that God would use us to love our neighbors and to bring the only true hope that there is, the hope of the gospel. That, that's what I would encourage you to be spreading. You want to get carried away with something? Get carried away with the love of God and the mission of God. You want to spread something? Spread the hope and the truth of God. Don't allow yourselves to be distracted. Don't allow yourselves to be taken off with, with lesser things, other things. But love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Trust that he is in control, that he is sovereign, and love your neighbor as yourself. And be a, be a hope dealer. Be one who spreads hope and love and truth. Amen? So Pastor Joe is going to close us with a song and... Uh, as, as we do, just let that be the, the meditation of your heart. Pray. Cry out for God to, to bring repentance and humility and love and mercy and compassion. And that God would use us uh, to bring some kind of calm and, and clarity in this, in this world that is so confused and so outraged right now. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, we love you and we, we bless your holy name as, Lord, over and over, that is the cry of our hearts, to praise you, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, be enthroned upon our praises. Take your rightful place in our heart. Take your rightful place in our lives. God, help us to have a, a heart of compassion and love. Help us to, to be a neighbor in this world, in this community. Help us to have boldness and righteous, righteous uh, boldness to, to bless other people and to share the truth. May we have your perspective in this time, God, and may we bring glory to the name of Christ, not reproach to it. We thank you in Jesus' name.